the topic of my presentation is approach to functional constipation so i would like to thank the department of medicine for inviting me to make this presentation so as we all know that chronic constipation is a common clinical problem seen across all levels of care and sometimes chronic constipation may be due to secondary causes like a neurological condition drugs metabolic condition but more often chronic constipation is functional in nature and most patients with chronic constipation require minimal investigation so therefore it is very important to have a systematic and judicious approach to evaluate these patients so that we can decide which patient needs how much test and what is the appropriate treatment strategy for a particular patient so before i move on to an up to the approach approach to functional constipation a brief overview of the different types of constipation so if you look at the physiology of uh, of of bowel movement there is transit of content in the colon and then once the content is in rectum and once uh, once a person is ready to evacuate then at that time the anal sphincter relaxes the pubo rectalis relaxes and the rectum contracts so there is a coordinated effort between these structures which results in evacuation of stool now this process may be disturbed by uh, secondary factors which includes metabolic conditions like diabetes mellitus hypothyroidism hypercalcemia drugs of which opioids are very important anticholinergics calcium channel blockers iron etc then a host of neurological conditions like spinal cord injury multiple sclerosis stroke parkinson's disease scleroderma etc sometimes there may be a mechanical obstruction in the form of stricture or a tumor painful conditions like anal fissure may make it difficult to pass stool so these are the secondary conditions which can result in constipation but more often constipation is functional in nature and if these patients in addition to constipation if they also have abdominal pain which is related to bowel movement then they may be having an ibs type of constipation but this also comes under the group of functional disorders so when we look at functional constipation there are three main types you have the slow transit constipation the normal transit constipation and dyssynergic defecation so if the transit of content in the colon is slow then that is called as slow transit constipation if the evacuation apparatus is not coordinating properly that is supposing if the rectum is contracting but the sphincter is not relaxing so there is a dyssynergia between the different structures and the, and the person is not able to pass out stool then those conditions are called dyssynergic defecation disorders in some patients the transit may be okay the evacuation apparatus may be okay these are called as having normal transit constipation what is the magnitude of this problem in our country so there are quite a few community based studies from india and they have shown that the prevalence is there is a significant prevalence of chronic constipation in our population the actual figure actually uh, depends on depends on how we so how we do the study so suppose if you are looking at the patient's own perception of the patient himself says that he feels he has constipation that is self perception then the prevalence is higher whereas if you use an objective criteria then the prevalence comes down so if you can see from this data if it's self perception the figures are more than if you use objective criteria in fact in some studies larger studies you know self perceived constipation can approach around 50% so then moving on to functional constipation how do we define functional constipation so as i told you the patient's perception is variable and therefore it's good to have an objective assessment of symptoms and the most commonly used criteria for functional constipation is the one which is suggested by the rome committee the most recent ones being the rome 4 committee uh, criteria so these these are elements in the criteria so what is the stool frequency does the patient strain during defecation is the stool hard and lumpy does the patient have a sense of incomplete evacuation is there a feeling of any anorectal blockade or obstruction during defecation is the patient using digital maneuvers to evacuate stool so if among these six if two of them are present for at least 3 months and the symptoms should have begun at least 6 months before your diagnosis then the patient is defined as having 
functional constipation. Now, so while these criteria are again good to have an objective assessment, they are good for epidemiological studies, research purposes to have a uniformity. In clinical practice, we don't have to strictly go by these criteria and we have to use a clinical judgment so that if somebody say instead of three months, if his symptoms are for two months, you're still going to treat that patient because he's got significant symptoms. So how do we approach a patient with uh, chronic constipation? So as I told you that many patients do not require uh, uh, a lot of investigations. In fact, they just need few tests. And therefore, if we are to decide which patient requires how much evaluation, a good history and examination is essential. Now in the history, the first part actually, we assess about the pattern of bowel movement and the nature of stool. So this includes how long the patient has had symptoms, what is the pattern, is it intermittent or is it continuous? What is the frequency of stool per week? What is the consistency of stool? This again is a very important aspect of history. And for this, using an objective method like a Bristol stool form scale is helpful, which I'll be showing in the next slide. Does the patient strain during defecation? Does he have a sense of incomplete evacuation? Is there a feeling of anorectal obstruction or blockage? Does he or she use manual maneuvers like digital evacuation, pelvic floor support, etc.? Does the patient have urge to pass stool? So these are very important symptoms to ask for in a patient with chronic constipation. So if somebody is straining during defecation, if he has a sense of incomplete evacuation, if there is feeling of anorectal obstruction or blockade, then most likely that patient has a dysanergic defecation. On the other hand, if somebody has no urge to defecate despite a passing stool, say once a week or twice a week, the patient does not have any urge to defecate, then most likely the patient has a slow transit constipation. So these are all about the nature of stool. And as I told you for the consistency of stool, the one of the very helpful uh, things to use is to use this Bristol stool form scale. So by definition, somebody with chronic constipation actually has a stool form, which is a type one or two, which is hard lumpy stool or a sausage shaped stool. Now for Indian population, the Indian Society of Gastroenterology has also said that in, for Indian patients, even type three should be considered for constipation. But if somebody has a type 5, 6, etc., then the patient is unlikely to have, con have a chronic constipation. Actually. Okay, so again, stool form is very important. Now, remember, this has to be asked when the patient is not taking laxative. Because once you take laxative, then the form will vary. So basically, you have to ask what is the stool form when the patient is not taking laxative. Next, then we have to ask about associated symptoms. And the important ones to ask are for abdominal pain and discomfort. As I said, if the patient has significant abdominal pain, which is related to bowel movement or stool consistency, then the patient may be having IBS constipation. I can just tell you the IBS constipation management is not too different from functional constipation. So therefore, what most of the things which we discuss will actually hold true even for an IBS constipation. The only thing is in those patients, you have to also think about managing the symptom of pain. Okay. And the next part of history is again very important. These are for these are the history of alarm features. And alarm features include history of bleeding per rectum, if there is any significant weight loss, fever, feeling of lump in abdomen, history of colorectal cancer in a first degree relative, if there is alternating constipation with diarrhea in somebody who is more than 50 years of age and has had a recent onset constipation. So if you have these type of features present, then these are called alarm features and these patients actually require investigation to rule out an underlying organic pathology which may be a colonoscopy or an imaging or both actually. So therefore, this is a very important part of history to decide how much you are going to investigate your patients. Then we also have to ask for use of laxatives in the past. What types, how long have they used, how did they respond? Next, we move on to the history to look for any underlying secondary causes. I told you constipation can be secondary or functional. So for secondary causes, we have to ask for history of comorbidities, which includes Neurological disorders like Parkinson's, stroke, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, metabolic disorders like diabetes mellitus, hypothyroidism, psychological disorders, history of any Hirschsprung's disease in the family or in the patient. And drugs, again, are very important factors. They can be the primary cause or they may be worsening the symptom of constipation. So these drugs include opioids, calcium channel blockers, iron supplements, the list is quite big, but these are the few of the important ones. Then diet and lifestyle. So we know that if the fiber intake is low, 
if the fluid intake is low, if the patient is not physically active, the patient is smoking, then these are all factors actually, they may be, they are risk factors for constipation. Then we move on to clinical examination. Again, it's a very important part of assessment, which includes general examination and systemic examination and per rectal examination. Uh, general examination and systemic examination are normal in patients with functional constipation, but, but this is very important to look for any secondary cause of chronic constipation. A per rectal examination is very important part of, in fact, one of the most important aspect of examination for patients with chronic constipation. And there are multiple things to look at. You have to inspect the perianal area. Then once the finger is in the rectum, if the patient is asked to squeeze the sphincter, you see if there's adequate squeeze pressure. Then the patient is asked to bear down and see if when the patient is bearing down or simulating a defecation, then the sphincter is relaxing or not. Is there abdominal perineal descent? Then with the finger, are you able to feel hard lumpy stool, which again will tell you that yeah, the patient probably has constipation. So if the patient does not have any alarm features, and these are just the few investigations you need for your patients, which includes hemoglobin to look for anemia, blood sugar to look for diabetes, TSH look for hypothyroidism, creatinine, electrolytes like potassium and calcium. These are the minimal tests you need. And then next we move on to the treatment. So in terms of treatment, this slide just shows the summary of treatment. So if you find an underlying cause, then you manage the whatever causes can be modified, whatever can you manage, that's the first step. You treat any underlying cause if possible. Then we begin with lifestyle and dietary measures. So patient's education is important about the condition. He, should be, he or she should be encouraged to do a good amount of physical activity, encourage adequate fluid intake, intake of fibers. And the therapy is generally begun with a bulk forming laxative like psyllium or methyl silver. This is the initial thing we use in most of our patients. And then if the patient does not respond, then we move on to osmotic laxatives like polyethylene glycol, lactulose, magnesium salts, sometimes even use a lubricant like liquid paraffin. Okay. Now these drugs when you're using, make sure that you're using in good amount of dose and patients should try for adequate amount of time before saying that it's not working. Because in terms of doses, there's quite a bit of flexibility for many of the laxatives, especially these uh, osmotic ones and the fibers. So therefore, you can use a higher dose if the patient has not responded to a particular dose, actually. So, and then if the patient has not responded to these laxatives also, then the next option we have is to use stimulant laxatives. Now, there is a little bit of a concern about the safety of the stimulant laxatives for long-term uses, but again, they are not as bad as they are made to be. And, you know, patients who have not responded to these uh, fibers and osmotic laxatives, this are a very good choice because if somebody you don't treat constipation properly and then there's a lot of straining during defecation, this may lead to hemorrhoids, fissures, sometimes even prolapse. So therefore, if the patient requires, then these medicines have to be used. Okay. So again, just to summarize, if there's an underlying cause and if it can be modified, you should treat the underlying cause if possible. And then we begin with lifestyle and dietary measures. Initial therapy is usually with bulk forming laxatives. If they don't respond, we go to osmotic laxatives or a lubricant. And if they don't respond, then we go to stimulant laxatives. So with this approach, more than 80 to 85% of your patients will actually get better. However, there is a small group of patients who would not respond to those measures we showed, I showed in the previous slide. So for these patients, you have to evaluate them further with special tests. And the purpose of these tests basically is to categorize this functional constipation into the categories I have discussed earlier. That is whether it is a dyssynergic defecation, whether it is a slow transit constipation, or whether it is a normal transit constipation. So for this, the tests we have are anorectal manometry and balloon expulsion test, defecogram, and colon transit study. Now colonoscopy, intuitively colonoscopy appears like a very important test for constipation, but I must tell you, in most of the patients with constipation, colonoscopy is actually normal. However, we still do it in patients with persistent symptoms because we want to exclude any obstructive pathology. So therefore, if colonoscopy is normal, then we first begin assessment for dyssynergia because dyssynergia is something which is more common than a slow transit. And for dyssynergic defecation, you need a manometry and a defecogram. So initially, we do these two tests. And if these are normal, then only we move to a transit study to look for a slow transit constipation. So anorectal manometry, again, I won't go into the details of test, but just to tell you that this is a very good test, which tells us 
about the physiology of defecation in the patient. So this is the color plot and the color actually represents the pressure. So this area is the anal sphincter area and this is the rectum. So you can see the pressure in the anal sphincter is high at rest, which is in this range here, whereas the rectum is relaxed. Now during defecation, the anal sphincter relaxes, as you can see by changing color to lower pressure colors, but, and the rectum contracts. So the rectum is contracting, the anal sphincter is relaxing and the patient is able to evacuate. So this is what happens in, during normal defecation. Now, if you look at this plot here, the anal sphincter is again contracted in resting stage, rectum is relaxing. During defecation, the rectum contracts, but the sphincter does not relax. The color remains the same, so the pressure is still high. So this again, so there is rectal contraction, but the sphincter is not relaxing. And this again shows that there is a dysenergy. The other test which we do for uh, dysenergic defecation is defecogram. A defecogram can be both barium or MRI based. More recently, MRI is getting more popular because MRI basically provides you structure idea about the pelvic floor structure which the barium does not. Although MRI is uh, expensive and not freely available, but if available, MRI may be a good choice actually. Now in defecogram, again, there are different aspects we look at. We look at the anorectal angle, the perineal descent, presence of a rectocele, or if there is any intersusception. So essentially, what is anorectal angle? So we draw a line through anal canal and a line through posterior wall of rectum. So this is the anorectal angle. So during defecation, this angle increases. That is, this becomes more straighter so that the stool can pass easier. Now in somebody who's got dysenergy, instead of becoming more, the angle becoming more, it becomes less. So you see in this example, actually it's become more acute. So this is a typical case of dysenergy or a reduction in anorectal angle during defecation. So if again, if the defecogram and manometry are okay, then we move on to transit study to look for any slow transit constipation. There are different techniques to look for transit, which includes marker studies, scintigraphy capsule. What we use in CMC is a marker study where we give multiple markers and then we take an X-ray. And essentially what we're looking at that towards the end of the study period, we want to see how much of these markers are actually retained. If more than the sort of normal cutoff is retained, then, then we consider that the transit is abnormal. Okay, so once you have done this uh, tests like defecogram, manometry, transit study, then you are able to categorize your patient into different types. So these patients who are having persistent symptoms, so again, just to reiterate that these tests are not to be done for every patient with tonic. Most patients, in fact, more than 80 to 85% of patients, you do not need these specialized tests. They can be managed as I showed you earlier. It's only in patients who are having persistent symptoms. Maybe they should be referred to a gastroenterologist so that these tests can be done. And then we can categorize the patient into different types. So if based on the result of your test, the patient has a dysenergic defecation, then in that patient, the treatment of choice is biofeedback therapy. Now, this is something very important because this therapy can be very helpful. It's a non-medical therapy and it can be helpful. Although it's not freely available in many places, but the therapy of choice is a biofeedback therapy. Also, these patients will require, may require laxatives as well to soften the stool. Now, during biofeedback therapy, the patient is basically educated about the process of defecation. And with the help of a manometry, he's shown what is abnormality during the defecation which he's, uh, which he's having. And then he's taught how to correct them. So this actually has been shown to have more than 70% efficacy in this cyanergic defecation. And we also have data from India as well to show that it is quite good. Now, what about patients with a slow transit or normal transit constipation who've had persistent symptoms? You've already tried fibers, you've tried osmotic laxatives, lubricants, stimulants. And if they're still not improving, then you have to go for the newer drugs. And there are quite a few new drugs which have been developed and which are available for constipation, although all of them are not available in India. Now, the, the main class of drugs include the 5-HT4 agonist, the chloride channel activators, the guanylate cyclase agonist like lenaclotide, the ileal bile acid transport inhibitor like elobixivat. We know bile acid is like a laxative. So if you inhibit absorption, then it also stimulates secretion and it also promotes bowel movement. Then more recently, you have the sodium hydrogen ex exchanger 3 inhibitor, uh, for example, tenapanol. So among these drugs, only the 5-HT4 agonist and the chloride channel activators are available in India. The others are not yet available. So the 5-HT4 agonist, basically the one which is available in our country is procalopride. 
The main effect is prokinetic, that is it enhances motility, but it also encourages uh, some secretion to make the stool softer. The recommended doses is two milligram per day. There are eight good quality randomized control trials showing that this drug is effective. The other drug, newer drug which is available is a chloride channel activator called lubiprostone available in our country. Here, the main effect is actually secretory. It enhances fluid secretion, but it also has some motility effect. So procalopride main effect is motility, some amount of secretion as well, whereas lubiprostone is mainly secretory and it also has some effect on motility. The doses is 24 microgram twice daily for functional constipation, whereas for IBS it is 8 microgram twice. Daily. That's why like I was talking that although the two conditions are similar, there are some difference, subtle differences in terms of management and also the pain is an important component of IBS and pain also has to be managed in addition to bowel movements. So this is my summary slide for management of persistent constipation. So, so if the patient has dyssynergic defecation, the treatment of choice is biofeedback therapy, they'll also require laxatives to soften the stool. And they, can, they may also take suppositories because the problem is mainly in the anorectal area where the defecation apparatus is not functioning properly. So the stool is, so even a suppository may be good in these patients. For slow transit constipation, the drug, the better drug to use may be a prokinetic like procalopride or the bisacodyl or picosulfate. In these patients, it's important to avoid fibers because fibers really may worsen symptoms in these patients. It's not very helpful. So for slow transit constipation, try and avoid fibers. If somebody has a normal transit constipation, then I think you can use any, you can use osmotic laxative, a secretory drug or a prokinetic drug. So with that, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention.